Y'all ready for the Word of God? All right, amen. Most of you are with me. Let's read. We're going to be in Mark 11 today. We just continue through books of the Bible at our church. Verse by verse, we'll be in Mark 11, 12 through 25. Uh, let me go ahead and read the entirety of the text, and then I'll do my best to preach this for you. The Word of God says this. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he, this is Jesus, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to them, or said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful for your word that you have uh, set aside for us today through your servant Mark to pin down for us to have this narrative, Jesus, of your life. And so, God, as we look at it today, may you move in our church. May you bless our church through it. May you sanctify your saints uh, through this passage of Scripture. God, help me to preach it well. Um, Help me to hide behind the cross, make up for my insufficiencies and flaws and um, Jesus, I just ask that you would perform exactly what you need for each soul in here, that you would would accomplish what you want in our lives, and that we would just take this time at the beginning of our week to look at what you would have us to be and what you would have us to do, and Lord, that we would, upon seeing that, be obedient. So help us to just lay our lives bare before you in this time, and may it be sacred for your glory and our good, and it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Let me remind you of uh, Mark 11:11, 11, 11, uh, which says he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late, and he went out to Bethany with the twelve. That's the verse I left off on last week as uh, I preached on the triumphal entry of Jesus. If you weren't here, let me remind you what happens there. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling prophecy. And um, he goes to the temple. There's a giant crowd around him. There's all kinds of celebration. They're expecting this kind of political revolutionary to overthrow the Roman government eventually. And he does that Forrest Gump anticlimactic. Well, I'm kind of tired. I guess I'll go home now. And they retreat and retire to Bethany, which is a, a suburb kind of outside of the city. And so that sets up the, the passage we look at today, which consequently takes place on a Monday. And wouldn't you have guessed that, right? Jesus is like cursing stuff, flipping tables over. He's having a Monday. That's what's happening in the Bible right here. Um, I don't know if you guys have Mondays like that. As pastors, we call them bread truck Mondays because you either want to quit your job and drive a bread truck or you feel like you got hit by a bread truck, one or the other. And, um, and so I have bread truck Mondays every now and then. But, but as Jesus has his own sort of bread truck Monday, he's dealt with all the human emotions of seeing people very shallowly uh, devote themselves to him. They have shouted Hosanna. They have cried out that he's the king, but he knows it's insufficient. He knows it's not genuine faith. And as he comes into Jerusalem the day after that, he is going to be pronouncing curses on everything, it seems like. Uh, namely, two things um, that we'll see. And these are the two things we want to look at. Jesus curses this tree and he cleanses the temple. Those are even alliterated. Isn't that nice? Uh, so Jesus curses a tree and Jesus cleanses the temple. And, and I think what starts the whole thing is Jesus gets up that morning and he's hangry. 
Um, he's just, y'all know what hangry is? It's hungry and angry at the same time. And um, it's like those Snickers commercials. You're not you when you're hungry. And this is Jesus. And so he's going in. And he, and he almost, when you read this, he almost seems irrationally mad, doesn't it? It seems like it doesn't even make sense that he would get this angry over this tree not having figs on it, doesn't it? Um, in my family, I don't know what, what really just ticks you off and grinds your gears, but at my house, it's when my kids open up like granola bars and bags of chips and candy bars and they they don't well they'll throw away the bulk of the wrapper but they tear off a little tiny corner and they'll leave that in the living room or on the couch or sometimes like three feet away from the garbage can and it goes right through me like I want to kill someone right but what I do instead of that because that would not be good what I do instead is I find myself yelling at inanimate objects yelling at the trash can or the trash that I have to pick up right and this is kind of how I imagine Jesus he's just kind of kicking rocks on his way into Jerusalem and he goes up to this fig tree hoping to get some food and he has kind of a tense reaction so let's focus on the fig tree first jesus curses this tree um it reminded me of um an, an interaction i had fairly recently my friend paul bokel uh, just pastored uh, or just planted a church that he's pastoring now in barbersville and um and he attended our church for about a month before he went and did that and um so we were hanging out together and um, his family came over for dinner and they have four kids and we have five so it was a big party at our house and uh, like the next week, we went out for coffee. And um, when he was leaving his house to come meet me at Starbucks to grab a cup of coffee, he was telling his boys where he was going. And his oldest, you know, they remembered the encounter of coming over to the Basham house. And his oldest boy said, oh, Pastor Will, I want you to tell him something for me. And Paul's like, okay, what's that? And he said, tell him that I love him. I was like, oh, that's sweet. And then the next boy says, oh, Pastor Will, tell, tell him that his kids are really cool. And Paul's like, okay, I'll tell him. And then his youngest son leans in and he says, Pastor Will, tell him that I hate him. <laughs> and it was just like the, the wildest, most random response. And Paul, you, if you know Paul, you know how he is. He was just like, he didn't ask any questions. He was like, okay, I'll tell him. And so we go grab coffee and he's, he tells me all the messages. And I, you know, I had some questions, but I just didn't ask him because frankly, I don't know if I want to know why that kid hates me. But I was like, all right, I'll pray for him. Um, but this is kind of like when you, when you encounter those like intense overreactions that just seem out of place, that had to be what the disciples had to feel like. When Jesus just curses this tree, it's like, dude, that was, that's a little bit over, of an overreaction, isn't it, Jesus? And so let's dive into this and see why he does it. Verse 12 says, on the following day, he came from Bethany and he's hungry. And seen in the distance a fig tree in leaf, that's important, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, and this is important too, for it was not the season for figs, which makes Jesus' response seem even more irrational, doesn't it? He shouldn't have even expected there to be figs on it. Uh, but the leaves kind of led him to believe that there were. And verse 14 has his, um, you know, little kid, I hate you type of reaction. And he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. His disciples heard it. Now they have to be thinking, man, he's got a bad case of the Mondays. Monday Jesus here is having a rough time. Uh, but, but I want you to understand that, that Jesus is not just throwing a tantrum here. That's not what's happening. Um, I think we could look at this and we can maybe be confused by this. Um, it, this is a miraculous event. The tree does wither, so something supernatural takes place. But I think the reason it's off-putting to most of us is because this is the only destructive miracle that Jesus carries out. You think about the things Jesus did that was supernatural or miraculous. Uh, he was always restoring things, right? He gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. He made the lame walk. He rose people from the dead. This is the only thing that he ever does that is destructive. He destroys this tree. So Jesus is not typically like a, a Marvel comic book character. You kids know, like your favorite superhero, they always got like fire shooting out of their hands. I think of the X-Men and Cyclops shooting stuff out of his eyes. Jesus isn't just going around blowing stuff up. And so that's why it seems so out of character to us when Jesus curses this tree and it withers because it's the only destructive miracle. But it's important for us to see that Jesus was not throwing a temper tantrum. He wasn't overreacting. He was acting very intentionally. And he was giving a parable or a, an object lesson to the entire nation of Israel. Um, I can explain it this way. Um, 
Deacon Rick is a, an avid bald eagle enthusiast. If, I don't know what title you give bald eagle enthusiast, but we're going to go with that. And um, there's, there's a couple of bald eagles that actually nest somewhere in Ona. And when he comes to church, he always sees them in the same tree and he can like track them down and stuff. And I wanted to impress him recently. So I took a picture of a bald eagle and sent it to him. And I had to zoom in a lot and crop it because there was a cage around it. I actually took it when I went to the Columbus Zoo. But I wanted him to think that I found it in the wild. Um, and he was impressed for a moment. And I couldn't keep lying to him. But, but if we see a bald eagle, what's it make us think of? I even put it on my Instagram story and I put a gif of an American flag in the corner. It makes us think of America, America, right? Bald eagles and whatnot. We put them on our t-shirts and, you know, fly the American flag and maybe the rebel flag, whatever. But like it makes us think of America and it makes us think of freedom. It's a, it's a symbol to us. And there's nothing really, there, there's a little bit of meaning behind the eagle with freedom. You know, he flies wherever he wants. He's majestic and stuff. But I've also seen like on Facebook, like the eagle crying. Have you guys seen those really poorly made graphic designs of like the bald eagle crying? Well, that's a, that's a clear symbol to us, right? It means it's a bad day for freedom. Uh, well, to someone who doesn't understand the symbolism of a bald eagle might not understand the connotation there. And as we look at a withered fig tree, as Americans living in the 21st century, it's a little bit lost on us what the symbolism would have been. But a fig tree withered for the nation of Israel was a very clear symbol, and it was a symbol of God's wrath and God's judgment. And so what Jesus is creating here by destroying this tree is he's creating a symbol to teach the nation of Israel about God's curse upon them, his wrath upon them for not fulfilling the covenant that he called them to. Namely, I want to show it to you from Jeremiah 8. There's lots of imagery in the Old Testament that I could include today, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you a couple. But Jeremiah 8, verse 9 says, The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? This is the, the case of when Jesus was around with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious elite. Now, in verse 13, Jeremiah continues, When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. You see, Israel's purpose, when God elected them and chose them and called Abraham out of his paganism and said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, the purpose was to use one nation to draw all nations to himself. Like we heard in the video this morning, that, that, that we are going to ultimately see the fulfillment of, of God bringing every nation, tribe, and tongue to worship him around the throne. That's all God's ultimate purpose in redemptive history. And he was using one chosen nation to do that. And they kind of missed what they were supposed to do. A place where the world who should be hungry for truth comes to find truth was Israel. But when they came to Israel, instead what they found was ethnocentricity, racism, and religious pride. May it not be true of us, church. And if we're not careful, we will, because of our depravity, all the time, every time, drift straight into the same thing. That we'll push people away from the gospel rather than drawing people to it. And when Jesus looks at this tree and he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, it's an eerie curse when you understand the symbolism that's built into it that Jesus is speaking of Israel. Jesus would soon, just a couple chapters later in Mark 13, predict that not only the city of Jerusalem, but their beloved temple, the center of worship for their faith, that it's going to be destroyed. And in Mark 13, verse 28, he says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. He references the fig tree again. As soon as its branch becomes tender and it puts out its leaves, something that Jesus actually saw, you know summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. And truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Jesus is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, which, by the way, was fulfilled in A.D. 70, where the Romans knocked over every brick, completely demolishing this. So let's look at the temple. The second thing we see is Jesus cleanses this temple. John records... Uh, uh, the temple cleansing in a different place. He records it at the beginning, right after Jesus' baptism. Um, there are a couple different views to this. One is that John just recorded it in a weird place. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke record it uh, during the week of the crucifixion. Another view is that there are two 
uh, temple cleansings, which, by the way, is the view that I hold. If you hold the other view, that's fine. But we don't know for sure. Uh, But what we do know for sure happens is Jesus comes into the temple at least once, maybe twice, and causes a big commotion, causes a scene. He's flipping over tables. I don't know if you guys are flip tables over kind of people, but if you've ever done that, you know that it is immensely empowering. Amen. Um, All right, y'all haven't done that. Y'all are good folks, okay? Um, One of our pastors, Jabes, is a big nerd, and he plays board games a lot. And um, he, he told me that he had like this board game group that, that he used to hang out with in college. It was incredibly nerdy. Um, but they didn't want to gamble money. And so what they did instead was their wager that they would put on whatever game they were playing that week was the winner of the game got to flip the table over and walk out of the room and like not talk to him again the rest of the day. And I thought that was the most hilarious wager. Um, and then all, all the other losers had to pl- you know pick up all the Monopoly money and stuff. But you know, if you win the game, like, see ya, flip the table over and walk out. Um, It causes a big commotion flipping a table over. And so Jesus does this, making a scene and and using it again as an object lesson to teach people an important true principle. Verse 15 says, they came to Jerusalem, he entered the temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. I want you to notice a couple things here. Number one, Monday Jesus is continuing on his rampage. Um, and, and I don't know what the disciples felt. Maybe they were a little bit embarrassed. I don't know. I imagine Peter like just kind of jumping in with him like, yeah, we're going to tear stuff up. And maybe Thomas is like, yeah. And he knocks over one little tiny trinket, you know. Um, but, but I don't know what they felt like. But it is, a, it is an interesting scene to imagine. It's like taking your toddler in the Hallmark store, right? It's just you know, lots of ornate things around. The temple was filled with expensive gold trinkety things that the, the Lord had called them to put up as object lessons to teach them about faith. And here the disciples come in making a mess of it all. And Jesus is being very intentional. Some of the intentionality is seen as he flips over the tables of the money changers, but those who are selling pigeons, he flips over, notice he flips over their seats. He doesn't flip over their tables. That would set the the pigeons free, and there would be monetary loss, and and the sacrifices would be lost. Jesus is very careful not to set the sacrifices loose. He's careful about the worship that's happening, but he's also disrupting the corruption that's also happening. Now, the temple sat on a 35-acre plot. You think about that. Like, that's... That's a, lot of, that's a lot of land. I typically, in, in the past, have not really thought of the temple as being that big. But 35 acres, that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big temple. And at this time that Jesus is doing this, it wasn't even completed. They had taken what God had kind of advised them to build, and they had listened to the advice of King Herod, um, who would ultimately be, play a part in Jesus' trial. They had uh, taken his advice to expand it, add more gold to it. Make it more, um, more expensive and make it bigger. What, what began as a place of God's instruction of worship had become something that the Jews were using to show off. And it would ultimately be completed in A.D. 64, only to be completely demolished just six years later in A.D. 70. This temple had become a place of idolatry and religious show and racism. One of the reasons Jesus acted as he did was because the Gentiles were being mistreated. Those who were not Jewish, who were coming in to seek to worship the one true God that they had heard of, were being exiled and kept out of the the worship center, and they were being exploited in the way that their money was exchanged and the way that they were sold sacrifices. Tons of sacrifices would come through. Josephus recorded in AD 66, he's a Jewish historian, he recorded that that year that there were 255,000 lambs that were killed. You think about that. A quarter of a million lambs that were slaughtered, not to mention like pigeons that were reserved for poorer families. That's tons of people rolling through the temple. Lots of them not being born in Israel. And as they come, what they are met with is not a welcome, warm greeting as they're coming to worship the one true king. What they're met with is an opportunity for greed to take in. They're being taken advantage of, not just the Gentiles, but also the poor. It's like when you go to Billy Bob's. Y'all know Billy Bob's? You remember that place? We used to love to go to the kid casino all the time. And when you go to the kid casino, what you got to do is you got to take your dollars and you got to convert it, right? What you got to convert it to? Billy Bob tokens. They have their own currency at Billy Bob's. 
That's, that's the way they you know, keep a handle on everything. Well, the temple did the same thing. They had their own currency. It was called a shekel. It was the Jewish currency. Well, at that time, the common currency had switched over to Roman currency. Denarii would have been most common. And especially for Gentiles, they would have been carrying denarii. And so one of the things you had to do was you had to uh, convert your money from denarii or whatever country you were coming from into the temple shekel. And what's evidently happening is they were taking advantage of these people as they were changing the money. That's why Jesus flipped their tables over. Also, the poor were being taken advantage of. Uh, Scholars suggest through historical research that at this time, um, those who sold sacrifices, who sold livestock and animals in the temple courts, were uh, marking up 16 times the normal price of those animals. It was just extortion. It was gross. Every every year when I do my taxes, the IRS asks me a question that I find humorous. Uh, They ask how how much money I received in the past year for baptisms. Um, And so I I could not imagine charging someone for their baptism, but evidently the IRS thinks that that's what we pastors do. Um, But but maybe they get their, their information from the Jews in the first century. They're taking this opportunity to make money. Now, this doesn't mean that commerce in and of itself is bad. Y'all remember the Southern Gospel Quartets that would set up and sell their tapes and CDs outside of the the sanctuary? You know, Chris, I know you remember that, right? We have to be real careful with that, right? And um, and, 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 and every time, you know, a Southern Gospel group would go to a different church, it would be, how do y'all feel about us selling tapes in the sanctuary? Do we got to put it on the porch, right? You're doing the same thing, right? There's nothing special about the building. Um, But this is where they get that from. They look at this and they kind of misunderstand what Jesus is angry at. What he's angry at is dishonest business and exploitation and the the fact that his people had forgotten who they were. There's a lack of respect and reverence. We see in verse 16, he didn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. This shows that people who were traveling, not worshiping, were just carrying their luggage through the temple instead of going around the 35 acres. They were walking through it as a shortcut. Jesus stopped that irreverent activity. Matthew also records that he heals people this day. Mark records and the other gospel writers record that he teaches this day. Verse 17 says he's teaching them and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus' focus is the nations. Remember last week that as he comes into town, people are looking to him, thinking he's a nationalist and misunderstanding that he is an internationalist. Uh, Danny Aiken puts it this way. It was popularly believed that when the Messiah came, he would purge the temple of Gentiles, remove the Gentiles. But instead, Jesus comes and cleanses the temple for the Gentiles. Jesus actually makes the way for Gentiles to come into God's family. And he defends these actions by going to the Old Testament in Isaiah 56, which says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say that the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, here's the fig tree imagery again, behold, I am a dry tree. God didn't want the nations, those far from him, to feel like a withered fig tree, that they couldn't come to him. He actually wants to draw the nations to himself so that they will flourish. And in their joining to the Lord, all nations will find their well-being and their salvation. Isaiah 56 continues. This is what Jesus is quoting. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain. This is Jesus' sermon text as he's in the temple that day. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. I want you to ask yourself very carefully, are there people that you pass by in your church invitations? Are there people that you casually ignore in your gospel conversation opportunities, whether consciously or subconsciously, do you write people off because of the way they look or because of where they're from or because of the color of their skin? Or because they're differences from you. The Great Commission calls you, Christian, by the way, to go unto all nations. The Greek word is ethnos, meaning all different types of people. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Isaiah 56 uses the same word. Ethnos will be brought into God's holy mountain, his temple, to worship him in spirit and in truth. 
You see, Israel had missed that, and Jesus was ticked off about it. When you marginalize people, when you discount people, when you're prejudiced towards people, it makes your Savior angry. And so it's not out of character for Jesus. When we look at this and say, Jesus is throwing a tantrum and Jesus is overreacting. No, he's not. He's displaying righteous anger, by the way, which we should emulate in the face of racism and prejudice. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in the same place that the Jews found themselves that day. We'll think as long as we're spiritual, and you don't got to go to church to be a Christian. I understand what you mean by that, but it's just wrong. Like, if I love Jesus, I want to be... I want to be among his people. Or we think that we're in the church and we're in our church services and singing our songs and reading our Bibles enough. And we think that that can get us close to God, even if our hearts are far from him. Let me get to a couple quick applications before I finish up. Number one is that you are called to bear fruit. The the fig tree teaches us this. That the fig tree had an outward appearance that made people want to walk toward it because it was full of leaves. It was a perfect picture of hypocrisy. When people looked at the tree, they said, that's a tree with lots of fruit on it. I'll walk over to it. Jesus goes and there's nothing there. God forbid that our church would look the same, that people would look at our church and look at our full building and look at the things that we have and hear our worship team on iTunes and say, that church, that's a leafy church. Let's go check it out. And they find no fruit. It's hypocrisy. It reminds me of Revelation 3, 1, where Jesus says to a local church, I know your works. Listen, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Jesus made the outward appearance of the tree match the inward truth of the tree, that there was no fruit on it. He says in verse 20, they, or it says they passed by and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Peter, Captain Obvious here, uh, rem- remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. In Jesus' cursing of the tree, it teaches us this principle, that if you remain fruitless for too long, God may take your ability to become fruitless away from you. He may take away your witness. Jesus answers him in verse 22, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, notice Jesus mentions his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. By the way, this is not a health, wealth, prosperity verse, a name it, claim it verse, that you can get whatever you want if you have enough faith verse. This is in response to a certain context. It's important to know that Jesus is teaching them about the withered fig tree. And he's saying the way to correct hypocrisy is through faith. He says, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Jesus is saying, if you want to correct your hypocrisy, don't just busy yourself with more churchy stuff. Rather, in faith, ask God to change your heart. Because fruit doesn't come by our own strength. Fruit comes by faith in God's strength. And so we need to bear fruit, not by working harder, but by trusting more. The last thing I want you to leave with is that we are to be cleansed just like Jesus cleansed the temple. You see, the decay of the tree showed that Israel was dead. The withering of grapes and figs was a picture of wrath. Hosea 9 is another verse that says, Like grapes in the wilderness I found Israel, like the fruit on the fig tree in its first season I saw your fathers. You see, before the cleansing of the Spirit, though, you were as dead as that fig tree. You were withered up. You had no ability to become alive in and of yourself. And Jesus, if you are a born-again Christian, if you've repented of sin, Jesus has graciously brought you to life. And he says this in John 15, Every branch in him that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are a tree. You need to bear fruit. The Bible also calls you a temple. And that means you need to be cleansed. Mark eleven twenty five, 25, last verse. Whenever you stand praying, forgive If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Before we take communion today, you need to let Jesus cleanse your heart. Are there things you haven't gotten over? Is there bitterness that you're holding on to? When God has so freely forgiven your jacked up heart, are you holding on to a lack of forgiveness toward other people? You better do business with Jesus before you grab that bread and dip it in that juice today. It's a serious thing. Let your temple be cleansed because we don't have a physical temple we go to anymore. You think this is it with garage doors and our janky concrete floors? This is not a temple. Where's the temple? 
It's us. Let me show you. Ephesians 2. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus is our cornerstone. Amen. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The dwelling place of God is his people. And that's serious business when we approach something like the Lord's Supper every Sunday. You are the temple of God. Make sure you are cleansed and forgiven, and you have forgiven others before you partake in this. And if you have not repented of your sins, this is my exhortation to you. Repent and become a Christian and become part of this temple of God so that you can worship freely and live for him for the first time. Let's bow our heads together.